the title of this session is Dare to be Different, and our key presenter is Francisco Nunez. Uh, first, let me introduce our two respondents to this case. And uh, let me just say, for those of you in the music world who are starting to go through withdrawal from this manner, number of presentations that aren't directly about music, we're heading your way. Uh, so uh, our two responders for this case, Katie Locker uh, from the Knight Foundation in Detroit and George Jacobson, Program Officer of Community Development in Detroit Kresge Foundation. So please, Katie and George, come on out. And a, a brief introduction of Francisco Nunez. Uh, everybody always says this first about him. He is a MacArthur Genius Fellow, but it's every bit as exciting to know he is a composer, a conductor, a visionary leading figure in music education, and the artistic director and founder of the National Arts and Humanities Youth Program award-winning Young People's Chorus of New York City. And I just want to pause for a moment. One of my closest friends has two of his sons in the chorus and is the most passionate advocate for the power of that program to really form his kids' lives, the spine of excitement in those kids' lives. Uh, Francisco is, uh, wherever he goes, exciting things start to sprout in his wake. Uh, currently, the chorus has 1,400 children from ages 7 to 18. All cultures, all economic backgrounds participate through in-school and after-school programs. He, is al he also leads the University Glee Club of New York City. He's a sought-after guest conductor by professional orchestras and choirs, master teacher and advisor, frequent keynote speaker, as a leading authority on the role of music in achieving equality and diversity amongst uh, uh, children in today's society, Francisco Nunez. Good morning. I feel like the um, Rocky theme should be playing at this point. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, good morning. I want to say thank you uh, to the Sphinx Con and to Aaron for inviting me to be here with so many amazing thinkers and leaders in the field. I was here with you yesterday, and I went upstairs and rewrote my entire speech. <laughs> said, it's all been said. You know it all. So I'm just going to tell you what I know. I've been going around the country, and I see changes in the choral arts, and in some cases, other arts programs. And these changes are affecting the way we reach our children. So often in the past few years, I'm told programs are struggling to attract children in the arts because of various circumstances in the areas. How can this be true when the population continues to grow? I recently received a letter. Well, thank you. I hope I look better. <laughs> I recently received a letter from a colleague in Pennsylvania. Dear Francisco, my board, all good people, did not really put their shoulders to the wheel when it came to raising funds for scholarships. I complained about the lack of diversity. I bemoaned the loss of a few children of color who did find their way to us but did not stay in a group. I fretted over the fact that I knew some children didn't return to the chorus or travel because of financial reasons. Meanwhile, we worked on building community within the group. We sang repertoire that was deep and meaningful, that emphasized diverse cultures, musics, populations, faiths. The economic downturn hit, and our numbers have gone down. The artistic pro product is as strong as ever, but with the economics being what they are, the choir was increasingly becoming exactly what I did not want it to be, benignly exclusive. I got from, you know, we spoke, and we continue to speak. Certain groups of children are not join, joining in to establish excellent art programs. However, numbers show that more children, in general, are participating in the arts programs. So what's the difference? In many urban and rural areas, disadvantaged or perceived poor children are attending after-school programs. These are programs in the neighborhoods, usually introduced by the school, where children stay until their parents pick them up. And indeed, they may take part at, at the school or they're partners with other community programs where they are walked. I, for example, started that way with the Children's Aid Society back in 1988. I would pick up children from the Greenwich uh, Village area and I would bring them back to Children's Aid Society. We do homework, we take music and dance and we chess and we hang out till their parents picked them up. On the other hand, people of means, perceived rich, tend to send their children to after school activities where they seek excellent programs through word of mouth or find them on the internet 
and neither the parent or the nanny brings a child. Here they study ballet, private music lessons, taekwondo, etc. We have two kinds of programs, generally speaking, after school programs and after school activities, those we take and those we study. Ray Suarez, a television journalist, told me once, he wrote a book in the 90s, I never read it, but he told me all about it. He talked about the move out of the cities into the suburbs, where the cities became a place to work until 5 p.m. and everyone left, but not everyone. It seems that in the past 20 years it's reversing. Because of the headache of commuting, which for some was taking up to two hours each way, those that left the city are coming back and moving into the red zones, where the rent is cheap. And many coined this revitalizing the city and bringing it back with new coffee shops, bike lanes, jobs, and arts. But many poor still live in these same neighborhoods. They see the revitalization differently. They're scared. I've been going around the country speaking to these communities. Recently, I was in Boyles Heights in Los Angeles, where through Radio Bilingue, we had a live program for six hours um, talking about the feelings of what it's like to be displaced. They continue to struggle to survive in these new revitalized zones where the price of milk is so high, the coffee tastes different, it's too expensive, and the old neighbor has already left because she couldn't pay the rent or was bought out. Of course, it's all perception. The numbers tell a different story. We've heard about that here a lot. But to one family, numbers mean nothing. Today, we, we see cities from Los Angeles to New York, from Boulder to Austin, from Bogota to Beijing, from Savannah to Detroit, where rich and poor are living side by side, many in the same building but they live different lives. They leave at different times, avoiding each other through the peepholes, and then some come in and out of the, from different entrances in the buildings. Many go to different schools in the same neighborhoods, different after-school programs, or if they do go to the same school building, they go to different floors, and they have different school names. Living together, but apart. Sound familiar? What, ab what about the arts in this whole picture? In the new, ever-changing neighborhood, I think it can play a large role in the community. The heart, and I know all of you know the same thing. The arts can help bring people together for, for moments, help children find discipline, poise, expression, the love of music. But we do this now. This is exactly what the arts does. But it does nothing really to bring us together. If we want to create really great art, and we want art to be an aid or a catalyst to help us fight segregation, poverty, and racism, we can't just keep sending teachers with little experience that look a little different to programs for a few years to sing and play to the children. Once again, perceivingly, it's not working. I think we should find ways to open the community programs that exist and allow any child to participate, from the after-school programs to the after-school activities. How do we bring them together? Here's a concept. If we can convince the very rich to participate in programs with the children who are very poor and the many in between. I think this will make a difference. But it's very difficult to convince a high-end power family to send their child to a poorly run community after school program. In light of urban revitalization, it is becoming clear and evident that in certain zip codes around the cities, not-for-profit organizations are finding it difficult to, to survive because they can't find children to serve. In New York City, the Children's Aid Society is already close to its buildings. It's moving to the Bronx, changing its entire paradigm and mission of what they do. Why? The middle class is leaving. The poor is confused, and the rich have their own programs. Of course, these are all generalizations, but they are based on statistics and on my research. But more important, it's that feeling around the nation that this is happening. And as families shift and the middle class moves away, the poor stay and the rich come back. Can everyone continue to find their cultural identities in these neighborhoods? We seem to be stuck. Is it so important to continue to be with your own people? Homogeneity is a powerful tool to make things happen. For example, in the workforce, I've been learning, it has been shown that if you want to get a particular task done in a short amount of time, it is best to bring together a group of like-minded folks from a homogeneous group and they will be able to accomplish the task quickly without this difficulty. Homogeneity is defined by one major characteristic, for example, race, religion, economic status, or geographical ties. 
and share more characteristics than differences. When people gather, they see community. This is a base human behavior. They are reinforced through the need of belonging. By celebrating similarities, they provide support and safety. It reduces psychological stress. And there's less chance of discrimination because similarities are reinforced and differences are not exaggerated. We here at SphinxCon, we have a community. We are all music makers. That's our common characteristic. But then things start to change once you start looking around. By working within a homogeneous group, until the highest level, until the best come out, I think we continue to create stereotypes. On the other side, it's also been shown, if a company wants to innovate and create something new, they must form a team of heterogeneous folks that bring in a different way to think, greater options to the process, expanded numbers or possible solutions, and greater connections to a wider audience. More and more, companies are looking for a diverse workforce because creativity is the most important goal in, in the workplace today. Is it possible that as we prepare to move forward, we can look at a new paradigm, a new paradigm, a shift in funding and a shift in the way that we treat the rich and poor in our converging neighborhoods? Can we do this with our reach in the arts? By creating out-of-school models that work in diverse neighborhoods, radically, radically changing membership and financial structures. I wanted to open this discussion with these great people here so we can move this concept forward. I'm doing good on time. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere I go, everyone is completely interested and excited about this. But it seems that collectively, we as a society, as a group, it hasn't moved forward. And I guess that's why SphinxCon has convened this meeting. As we look to the future of arts education, how can programs survive, survive urban changes? According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, 51% of the world lives in an urban environment. According to NYU Urban Institute, in about 15 years, 80% of the world will live in an urban environment. Cities are going to expand and grow. They're going to take over. And people are leaving to find work. Yet, according to the UN Population Fund, poverty is growing faster in those exact same environments than in the rural areas. So as people leave cities, many are going back into the suburbs and then coming back. So this flux is going, but at the same time, cities are taking over the suburbs. So we're all going to live in a city. Not all, many. According to the 2011 census, 311 million United States, um, um, the United States has a population of 311 million. And of that, 150 million are persistently poor and near poor people. That's 48%. And it does not include the 35% of those living as lower middle class and middle class families who live paycheck to paycheck, bringing poverty closer to about 85% in this great nation. Recent census numbers show at a glance around schoolyards and community centers that children are becoming more racially and ethnically diverse than ever. But they don't play together. It is this diverse youth population that the existing paradigm of community chorus and orchestra will rely on for their future. What happens in seven years when the young minority born child is old enough to audition for an excellent after school program or ensemble? Will they be accepted? Will they be able to pay the tuition? Excellent choirs and orchestras created over the past, you name the years, were created on the traditional tuition based model. You audition, you pay, you participate. Today, because of the economic shifts, we have less children to participate in these programs. Those that could pay are finding it difficult to pay the cost of their license, so they stop coming. And many of those who could never pay participate in programs which are funded by you, the private sources. So thank you. These two programs are separate and are both struggling to survive. The challenge I find as cities progress in bringing more workers to live side by side with their employers, how can we convince not the workforce but the people as parents to bring their children together. Why must children be separated to receive an education? We talk so much about racial integration. We see black and white. But it's not only about color, because it doesn't mean if you're one color, you're poor or you're rich. If our goal is to create great music makers, active citizens, boast academic, academic achievement, mend our differences, and reduce poverty, 
economic integration is the way to go. I find it difficult to convince funders of this. To receive funding that serves only the poor makes sense. We can boast of many programs that are successful, but the majority are not. And if a child succeeds from these programs, as I personally have, growing up in Latino Washington Heights from a poor family, it takes a long time to get over the feelings of being different. I've learned once again, personally, and in my work with the Young People's Course in New York City, that if I can bring poor and rich children together, the outcome is magnificently more dramatic and it's working. The peer-to-peer -peer learning overshadows everything we do as teachers, creating an environment of excellence with great tools such as a beautiful space, a wonderful educator, and children from different backgrounds who want to learn makes a brighter future. But again, I'm told if you have children in your program who can pay, you don't need my money. Let them pay for everyone. But the few cannot pay for all. We need societal su support. It is our democratic duty to help all children. I don't want to separate them. Let's bring them together. Those that can pay, OK, make a donation. Those that cannot, great. Come on, we got something for you. Equity means every child feels the same. If one group pays for the other, the children will not befriend each other because they know about it. If this change that is coming is true, I'm talking about the change in population in the cities. Children will live side by side, but I think they should come together. Over time, the effect of their mixing will not only create a better artistic model with real authentic performance practices, but they will influence each other to make better decisions and have more options to choose from. They learn new paths to follow, learn to work in different places, better school choices, marriage, civic responsibility, empathy. They will seek diversity for the rest of their lives. As programs shift, their memberships will be their membership to be inclusive, and uh, as programs shift, their membership to be inclusive, and funders participate in this model. Programs will redefine themselves beyond the musical notes. They may understand that once you have the trust of a young person, because you've captured their souls through the power of music, you now have the responsibility of helping them achieve greater things, such as higher education. And it has been said that it only takes one child to graduate from college to help a family out of poverty. That's what happened to my family. Tutor them, give them SAT training, financial literacy, essay writing skills, help them prepare for college, as well as theory, performance etiquette, and bowing techniques. Whether they become musicians or not, they will always have music in their hearts, but more importantly, we will have, they will have trust in people, in society. And if they are gifted enough to make it to the top, they'll be comfortable to participate and know how to make friends. And if they don't choose that life, they will participate as adults, because they're not afraid of who's on stage. They're not different. They know them. They know how they think and where they come from. And this trust from childhood helps them really see people that look different. The most important lesson I learned in diversity is not learning about others through diversity. It's learning about yourself. Building the future musician is building trust among people. The same way I trust you will sing in tune, not fall on me while I dance, and breathe together as we play. If we continue to separate the poor from the rich, it will stay the way it is today. I've seen it in my program for the past 27 years, and I know it works. I don't know if it works for you, but maybe we can talk about it. Thank you. Two different angles of response to that. Uh, George. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Francisco. That was uh, wonderful. Um, uh, so I'm at the Kresge Foundation. We are based here in Detroit, and I feel I just want to start from that positioning. Uh, I grew up here in this area. My background's in urban planning, and I am one of the many urban planners who are infiltrating the field of arts and culture for good or ill. Um, take that for what it's worth. Uh, I've been at the foundation for a number of years, and you know, when, we, when I started, we funded one type of project only, capital challenge, uh, 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 capital campaigns for large buildings. And we have substantially transformed most of our programs, if not all of our programs, entirely away from that prior model to focus on one, one big issue, uh, expanding opportunities for low-income individuals in America's cities. It's a guiding frame for all of our work in our national programs, uh, be they arts, uh, arts and culture, which you heard a little bit about from Maria Rosario Jackson yesterday, as well as Jamie Bennett, who we work closely with on the national level, uh, health, uh, human services, environment, uh, et cetera. Uh, I'm on our Detroit program, uh, where I focus on arts and culture. Uh, in our frame, even though we, we, we fund a great deal of many organizations uh, and have since 2007 with general operating support, um, roughly just say 80 unique 
in individual organization since 2007 to the tune of about $20 million. We get to learn a lot about the work that they do. Uh, and, and whether it's in school or after school programming, the partnerships here in this community are very real and very deep and there's, there's great need. And uh, I think with most of the nonprofit sector, there's, there's such great need um, that can never be met, met fully um, by the nonprofit sector or the funders that are supporting them. It's, it, there, there is that mismatch and that disconnect, uh, which I think everyone has really heard about. But clearly within the arts realm, there's, there's nothing short of transformational power of the arts in, in communities and places. Um, the, the, I'm not gonna focus on the arts piece of the conversation on this one because what I think is really interesting is what Francisco is uh, uh, putting forth on the idea of, of, of not necessarily integration, but, but collaboration, cooperation, engagement. And frankly, you know, being from this particular community where there's a great deal, many challenges, uh, and, and frankly, systematic inequities uh, in so many areas, transit being a major one. Um, you know, the access to opportunities and programs is not even across the region. Uh, broadening that frame apart from arts, I mean, in the urban planning world, this is, this is uh, uh, examining the urban underclass uh, and concentrated poverty. And the frame around that really is how do you address that is, is, is focusing on, on, on expanding opportunities, frankly, but through mixed income uh, uh, projects that elicit some sort of mixed income result, where people from different sectors, different spaces, different walks of life are engaging one another because you are furthering networks, you are furthering opportunities, be they formal or informal. Um, and then I, I think that's, that's, that's a major uh, challenge for communities like Detroit or Rust Belt cities. I, I also would just want to, you know, I saw an interesting thing today on the perception of, um, it wasn't so much on the perception, but uh, clearly in, in this community, there is the perception that there's a, a wholesale changeover of who's moving in versus who's moving out. The Center for Community Progress, which focuses on uh, vacant, uh, uh, vacant land, essentially, uh, put a, a study out that I just saw today uh, before meeting Francisco that it's really only, I mean, the idea of people moving into cities is happening, but it's happening in certain places more than others. You know, it's, it's a dis, uh, difference between uh, whether you want to call them hot market or weak market cities or strong cities, um, uh, poorer cities, it doesn't really make a difference. It's, it's a little uneven that the, the, the broad frame of people moving into cities is certainly a dynamic that's happening, but it's, it's, um, but it's happening it's, now. It's happening. It and is it's happening. Gonna, and it's going to start to happen even more so. And it's happened already very much so in many other cities. And so what it, all it is to say is there's a dynamic at play, right? Uh, and through all the, 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 the programs that I, I know I see uh, within this community, as well as those of our national arts and culture colleagues, specifically focused on creative placemaking, you know, the, the ability of arts organizations who are already stretched pretty thinly, all things being equal, stretched pretty thinly, um, uh, to tap into these other networks that absolutely need to happen, your community and economic development partners. I mean, that's a thrust of creative placemaking, getting at the table and getting into the game, participating in the, in, in the dynamics. And I think to get to the outcomes that I think uh, we are hoping for, those are key connections that need to be made. I can't speak to national philanthropy on this, but I think in the Detroit community, in the context here, like these things absolutely are fundamental. Uh, bridging the connections and divides between uh, Detroit neighborhoods, the suburbs, very different, uh, between educational systems and access to those educational systems, as well as access to, to arts and cultural programming. So I, th I think everything in, in spirit, absolutely, those things, are, uh, 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 we'd be with you, that the, 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 the integration of economic uh, 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 strata is, is a key feature for things going forward. But you know, the question is, how do you get there? And, and what level of policy do you focus on? But I'm asking you that. And, and, and you, you're the funder. And I might turn to Katie on the side. <laughs> well, and, and I could say, you know, the one really quick thing too, reflecting on some of yesterday's conversations, and I want to certainly get, I'm watching my clock, uh, clock in front of me here too. We had our 15 minutes for responding. I'm eating that up. Feel free. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you know, most people re recognize the work of foundations by virtue of the grant, but what we're really not so great at talking about is all the work that happens behind the scenes, not just about that grant or the individual grant. It's, I think, in this particular community and many other communities, too, it's, it's the engagement with other civic leaders to try to drive towards more equitable, equitable outcomes. And I think we need to do a better job of communicating about that, uh, whether it's about the programs we're initiating or the grants that we're making and why we're making them. Uh, but more to the point, what, what are the ways others can also participate in those conversations, too, in broadening it? So I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you. Katie. Uh, so I am 
um, truly a respondent. So Francisco <laughs> and I met like five minutes before we came out here. Um, and um, th some of you know me out here. I'm, I'm, I'm not an arts funder. Um, I'm the program director here in Detroit for the Knight Foundation and, and we do invest um, about six million dollars a year into the arts here in Detroit, but actually I'm not the lead on that. The, uh, our team out of Miami, many of you know uh, our vice president, Dennis Scholl, um, and Tatiana Hernandez really lead that. But um, there's a couple things um, that really resonated uh, with me from Francisco's remarks. Um, one really um, specific to the arts and our um, type of investment. Uh, and one more about the city of Detroit and, and, and what's happening here. And I'm, I'm a resident of the city of Detroit. I, I told these guys, when I leave here, I'm gonna go take my recycling back. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, so on the art, um, it's, for me, one of the uh, most wonderful things about being involved in, in Knight's Arts Program is our Knight Arts Challenge. Um, our Night Arts Challenge, I imagine many of you know about, but um, in the cities that we run it in, and we're, we're launching our third year of the Night Arts Challenge here in Detroit, um, we open the door and we say, give us your best idea for the arts. That's it. That's, that's all we ask. Uh, we say anyone can apply, so you can be an individual, individual, you can be a nonprofit organization, you can be a for-profit, it's across all spectrums. I've got a, I know I have a few winners out here. Uh, Ballet Folklorico was our People's Choice winner last year, there they are. <laughs> um, and um, I really enjoy the Night Arts Challenge because we allow our community to bring forward ideas. We make a really concerted effort to get out broadly into our community and, and get everyone to apply. So the Detroit Symphony has, has won the Night Arts Challenge um, as well as Ballet Folklorico. And we, so we hit a whole spectrum of small to large and we ask for artistic excellence and we ask that it impacts our community. But we don't ask who do you serve. And I, I actually think that, that that is the focus of, of why we, a foundation that invests in informed and engaged communities, invests in the arts, because the arts is a place where everyone from the community can come together, and a place where um, when a wonderful performance happens, when a great mural is created, um, when a great event is taking place, um, if we do it right, it's open to all, and it's a place where we ex you have an exchange of ideas and conversation that we don't expect. Um, and I particularly enjoy it when it's in those unexpected places. Um, uh, you know, the, the random acts of culture that Knight also led with, I think has brought about some really interesting conversations and put different people um, together. And um, so it, I think the arts can provide exactly to the point um, that I think, I, I think you're, um, you're starting from, Francisco, is that it is a place where a variety of people can come together. Um, and they don't have to be from the exact same background to enjoy a, a performance, right? Or to be part of the performance. Um, so a, a power, powerful place to start. And then to, to speak from the Detroit's perspective, I think without a doubt, um, Detroit is at that moment that says, are we going to build a community for people of wealth and a community for everybody else, or are we going to build one community? We have been a community of persistent poverty. And while you can point to wealthy neighborhoods and poorer neighborhoods in the city of Detroit, you cannot find any neighborhood in the city of Detroit that doesn't have a vacant home, that doesn't have blight, and that doesn't have any, uh, still a need for more services. And so we are redefining even our wealthy neighborhoods and even our wealthy communities. Um, and it is philanthropy's role now to say, when we engage in that investment, whether that's commercial re revitalization of a corridor, whether that's what types of programs are offered after school um, and who offers them, um, are we saying we are only serving a certain community or are we making sure that those programs are built so that they serve everyone? And I think um, uh, George and I work a lot together and philanthropy works a lot together in Detroit. I think we are attempting to figure out how we serve a broader community. Um, I, don't, I don't think the answers are there because there's a tension, right? There's a tension. Me, you, me... Want to fund, you want to fund a program to serve those most in need. 
right? So you, I got, I got to get all my dollars to the people who need it the most. So that, that's to me is the the the, uh, the 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 big question, because I, from my experience, have seen that when you mix the children together, the outcome is so much greater. Mm -hmm. Yet. I'm told that I'm only going to pay for those over here. But these other kids, they're, they're not necessarily rich. They just might not be as poor. But I need them. Mm -hmm. And then if they start paying for these other children, then it, be, it changes the dynamic. They won't be as excellent on stage because they, they change. Now, we keep them separated. Eventually, they'll come to the higher level over here and on their own. But they don't know how to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So how do we? work at it right away. In New York City and, and many other cities around the city, they're living in the same building. And I find that to be amazing that they go to different schools and mm -hmm. they go to mm -hmm. different floors, different everything, and, I, and then they come out together. But we're a great city. I don't, I don't understand that. So how can we teach you as funders that this is a really important way and give us money that affects everyone? You know, the one thing uh, that, that comes to mind for me is not necessarily about the strategy to acquire funding because it, it might just be my style of working or it might be uh, uh, some of the folks that I work with, our, our particular set of styles. You know, having a two-way dialogue with funders is absolutely important. And I don't know if those opportunities are present in other communities as readily as they, I feel or perceive they may be here. And I could be totally wrong in my illusion about uh, that, that two-way dialogue uh, and the power dynamics that come with that. There's no question there's power dynamics that come with that. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon nonprofit organizations, really, if you're, it, it, to, to, to make those points of conversation. And I don't know, how, you know whether that's to find funding from sympathetic funders to do the evaluation to suggest those things, or pull in folks from different sectors who are elevating that topic. Um, Myron Orfield, a uh, former legislator from uh, Minnesota, he wrote a great book, book a number of years ago called Metro Politics. Um, what he's continued to do on that frame uh, of metro politics is look at integrated schools and the outcomes of integrated schools. It's a wholly different sector than thinking about the arts world, but the, the, the research is there. Integrated schools, uh, uh, students come out there uh, achieving at a, at a higher rate. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, it's, I, maybe George and I are both a little delusional, or maybe Detroit is, di is a little bit different, but I actually, um, and I, actually, it's fair to say, Detroit is different than New York City. And, and so mm -hmm. New York City, you really do have that full spectrum of wealth. And um, Detroit proper, we do not have the full spectrum of, of wealth yeah. in, the, in this city. So it is different. So um, I, in some ways, I don't think we're the best people to respond. <laughs> um, because I, I, I think it's real. I think I've actually been thinking about a program that um, is for youth in, in engineering. Um, and, and I remember reading the report. It was a grant I was um, just closing out. I hadn't led the grant, but I, w I was closing it out. And I thought, ooh, my godson would be really good in this program. And then I was like, would they let him in? He has too much money, right? And, but wouldn't it be great if he could be in it? So I think I, it's real, but at the same time, as a funder, I, at least for my funding, even outside of the arts world, um, I'm about good programs in my city. So I, and our city has so much need that I don't necessarily say who are they serving. I'm like, well, right. sir, sir. But if we look at it in a global city. way, mm -hmm. what's happening around the country, mm -hmm. I'm looking at it that way because I'm working yeah. now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the board of Course America. We're discussing this all the time there, and I'm working specifically in different cities, in Twin Cities. I'm working in Savannah, and, and I'm in the Dominican Republic right now. And mm -hmm. my program in the Dominican Republic is to bring the rich and the poor together. Yeah. And it's very difficult mm -hmm. now. Yeah. It's been very challenging, and, I'm, and then to bring them with the Haitian children. And I'm working on a program for that now. So, but I think that will help the mm -hmm. countries and the children of the countries, as well as our cities here. Mm -hmm. So, but what I, and everybody loves the concept. Mm -hmm. They really do, like you two do. Mm -hmm. And I love to hear what you guys think. Well, we're just about to. Let me use that as a segue. Uh, uh, this is an opportunity for you to uh, ask a clarifying question, to uh, provide our, our speakers a chance to take their thoughts a step further. Uh, two little things I'll note. Uh, where we, from all three of them, we heard the value of heterogeneity in this work. 
that in a conference that's focusing on diversity, this is a real ringing endorsement of the value that comes from mixing together those who are not usually mixed together. And we've heard the theme that started yesterday about this importance of disrupting established patterns uh, in three different ways. We heard that mentioned. And I just have to make a little side note on my uh, taxi ride in from the airport, within five minutes, the cab driver had identified exactly the themes about Detroit that you two have mentioned. He mentioned that the area, the challenge is the wealth disparity, and he, within two minutes, had talked about the arts as being a significant factor for bringing that together. And he didn't know anything about who I was or what I was f uh, coming here for, but he himself identified that, and he went to this very challenging local issue about the Galapagos Arts Center, mm -hmm. um, you know, fancy, high-profile arts organization from uh, Dumbo in Brooklyn, New York, relocating to Brooklyn for obvious and healthy reasons, and he said, and we got arts organizations in town that are saying, hey, wait, what about us? So within five minutes of touching down in town, all the key issues of the revitalization of the city were introduced from the cab driver. You didn't happen to catch his name, because I, <laughs> I think that could be a helpful asset to us in communicating what's happening. This guy is on it, I'll tell you. Uh, so Great. what questions are rising up for you to uh, challenge? Yes, right over here. And please stand. I'm at Kandayo Bendeli with Hattie Lou Theater in Memphis. Um, this is a question to the panel, and, and if anyone in the audience has any uh, response to this, I would be interested to hear it. Um, you know, we're entering into this generation, which I'm a part of, where I had um, poor parents, and I've been able to go up a little bit, you know, above the poverty line. And I find that a lot of our subscribers and individual donors are the same way, that they have, well, actually, they become affluent. And one of the things that they do to reward themselves is that they purchase a subscription to the theater, or they purchase a subscription to the ballet or to the symphony. And while we are inclusive and we're breaking down the walls of uh, socioeconomic segregation, then does that cheapen these banners that um, the people who have arrived um, are bestowing upon themselves? Because do they feel that, okay, well, Anybody can now come to the theater, and so I guess I didn't make it that much. Or, you know, anybody can get a Mercedes, so therefore it's not as valuable. And so I find that, you know, individual donors make up the bulk uh, of the income that comes into the theater. And so I have to make certain that those people who have the financial wherewithal to support the theater, um, they still realize the benefits of their success, while at the same time, making it accessible to the less fortunate of us. So how do we reconcile that? Well, uh, <laughs> great question. I think uh, it's a great question. Uh, I, uh, go ahead. Uh, my immediate reaction is that I, I don't, the perception that we have is that if we take something away from someone, we're going to make it less for ourselves. And in my experience, I've only gotten more from it. And I believe that people believe that. So if, 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 a, if, a, if someone who is not of, of high means is coming to the arts project, they're not gonna take away my experience that I'm gonna get that's per, very personal for being at the same place if I purchased a ticket and I was there first. If that's the question you're asking. I, I think that um, there are a lot of barriers to break through that, but I think that everyone will gain from it on a very personal basis. So I don't think anyone's gonna feel um, differently. I was just going to say, I don't know if there's anything there to reconcile. There's only things to embrace and champion. So I, 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 um, I don't, I don't, Scott Harrison's here, right? I think he's hitting. So Scott Harrison with the Detroit Symphony is here, and I would go and talk to him. I think that the Detroit Symphony has done some amazing work with the assistance of the Knight Foundation. Um, uh, Offering support. <laughs> and, and Kresge probably helped out a little too, but... Um, uh, in, Let's see where this is know, going. <laughs> yeah, so, but the, the symphony um, in Detroit live streams so many of the performances and makes them available mm -hmm. broadly, right? So I don't have to walk in the doors of, of the, the symphony to experience that performance. Um, and then um, we're doing, we've just launched uh, the symphony in the D, uh, this 
Scott can explain it much better, but um, community uh, um, engaged, um, building a symphony uh, with, with uh, a composer, and um, we open the doors really broadly for that, but I think then the symphony works still really hard on, there are certain patrons who are gonna make sure they feel special when they walk in the, in the doors, so we have both widened our doors at the symphony, and then the symphony's done a great job of still um, having very dedicated and passionate supporters who understand that widening those doors make the symphony stronger, make it more interesting, um, and, and uh, just make it more impactful. So I think it's possible, even for something that is as long-standing as the Detroit Symphony, to, to open its doors wider, to be, to be more inclusive, um, and still keep raising, raising money. How to do, Scott? Fair? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I would just add, as a fellow theater person, uh, issues of uh, status, is a, a social status issues are part of the training of actors. Uh, most actors in the US in the last 10 years, 15 years or so. And so issues of status really are hypersensitive for people in the theater. And it may be something for a future SphinxCon to think about, the, the kind of extra level of sensitivity and investigation that really is, uh, has, breathes through the whole of the theater community at this time. Other questions for our panel? Yes, a question here, and then a question there. Hi, I'm Kevin Replinger. I'm a grad student at Wayne State right here in Detroit. Um, and I guess what it sort of sounds like uh, we're talking about here when it comes to bringing other people in and trying to address this. And the things that I've actually seen other organizations work on so far are these pay what you can performances. And of them, I'm not sure what the success rate is in different organizations. It would be interesting to see a survey of how that's been successful to trying to say, we're opening the doors to everybody. If that lets people in, does it have a negative effect upon the people who do pay high ticket values to come to your organizations? And are they less inclined to then pay those when you have those? But I know that Mixed Blood Theater Company in Minneapolis uh, introduced their revolutionary radical hospitality program where they remove ticket prices from every single performance of every production they produce and said we are going to live entirely on people determining that the ticket value is whatever they feel like donating and so it's it's one of those things where you were talking about having you know the well-off students have tuition that then covers you know the students who can't afford it and I'm not sure I, I hear the caveat with this could be challenging to integrate them together, but it seems like there are places that are doing it and working on it and still having these invested donors as are at the DSO for the many numerous productions and components of their operations that are trying to expand to a broader population. I don't know if there's anything you can say to that or experience you have with it, but that's what it feels like the conversation is pushing towards. Any thoughts? Well, we're, we're, we're pushing into audiences at this point. You know, how does the audience feel? And I, I wanted to start with the young people. I think a lot of the problems of the social strata will change if we start with the young people. And because uh, the, these are problems that we have now because we weren't taught. So uh, if we can figure out how to make a child feel comfortable with somebody else and feel good about who they are now, when they grow up, they might feel different about this. And maybe they'll all get jobs because they'll all be educated. I don't really have too much to add on that particular <laughs> topic other than, you know, it's, I think organizations have tested it and some have had positive results and others I would say probably mixed results on, on just that, the, the, the transactional tool of the, 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 the pay what you can. Um, but I, I would agree, it's just, it's just how are we providing the greatest access and, uh, and how are you communicating about the access you're providing? And I think the communication and the messaging around that is, whether it's, whether it's pay what you can or reduced rate, I mean, the messaging is really the key piece of it because unless that's coming across pretty clearly as to why you're doing it, who you're serving, and what the purpose of it is, you're missing an opportunity. It seems to me also that when it comes to when you work with, with programs, if a child, if you have a program that's, where children are paying tuition, it seems to be frowned upon, or an orchestra, or a chess program, whatever it is that you're doing, it, they, we want to fund those programs that have nothing and we will pay everything for them. So there's no investment the other side of the story, there's no investment from the family if they don't pay anything into the program. So there's a real dichotomy there. There's something strange going on in the messaging that we're giving our folks on should they pay, should they not pay. And you have pr programs like Curtis's um, that's free tuition if you can make it into it. 
And anyone can go there as long as you make it into it. So should we just dissolve all of this? Um, I'm not sure. But that's really a confusing thing for me when I speak about what we do. Yeah, I'll just add uh, one example. I heard of a, new, a comedy club that thanks to a new technology is free attendance and you're charged per laugh. <laughs> uh, because it actually counts the number of laughs at your seat with a 200 laugh uh, price limit. That's uh, there was a hand over here, I promise. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Jim Leha from UMS in Ann Arbor. Um, one of the kind of themes that I'm picking up on in a lot of these conversations is um, questions about whether we're with efforts around um, greater diversity, whether we're trying to create sort of integrated um, arts organizations that are really both diverse in terms of aesthetic representation, but also accessibility by audiences and leadership, staff, and so forth, um, or this question of maybe we want to pour um, funds and money into a lot of different organizations that represent a lot of different cultures, and that's the way we sort of achieve multiculturalism. Um, and I find this to be a really interesting conversation at the moment um, in reflecting on Detroit specifically with our Detroit funders here at the table. Um, how, how, do we, how should we be conceptualizing Detroit if we're thinking about sort of an integrated whole? Because as Katie said, you know, maybe the spectrum of wealth doesn't exist within the city, but certainly the spectrum of wealth exists in the tri or quad, quad county mm -hmm. area as we might conceive it. And um, I guess I'd like to hear more on what, um, what we think the role of our sort of outlying communities and suburbs where we might actually be able to sort of integrate and achieve a certain kind of integration as a region, um, what that role is, you know, what, what we should all be doing as sort of outliers in the region and not in the city proper, one. Um, and the other thing being that if, we're, if we are pouring funds very specifically into Detroit only into places where we think there is the most need, are we not just recreating or reinforcing the, the problem of segregation? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> it, right? So, exactly the questions that are the constant. And I, I think, um, you know, the, what Francisco starts us with it, is the question everyone is, is constantly battling. If it were easy, we would all be doing it, right? And, <laughs> and so, it's, there's not an easy answer here. I think that um, I'm certainly challenged in Detroit, and, and we see this dialogue constantly. Um, I, for, for uh, five years before joining Knight, worked for a foundation that was investing very heavily in greater downtown, in, into building the revitalization that is, that is about new restaurants and new retail openings and new streetscapes and, and um, new housing that's mixed income and mixed use. Um, and there's a lot of tension about that. Why, why are you investing in that when there is someone around the corner who's living in substandard housing, when there's someone down the street that is hungry, when there are children that are not getting a good education? And it, it is an absolutely fair question. And I think that the um, tension that, that philanthropy feels in Detroit and the, and the challenge that I face every day, and I think um, uh, I will speak for George and say he faces as well, is that there is not enough money in philanthropy for us to change everything. And so it's how, how do we then, with the support of our, our boards, most importantly, mm -hmm. think about where money makes the greatest difference? And I, I, um, I want to go back to, to, to something um, George said, and it's, you know, we all hate a, a evaluation on some level, like all oh, these reports, but I, th I, I think, um, the more that the message you're talking about, Francisco, about what is the value, not just to that child who doesn't have means, but to the child who has means to actually have an integrated experience, to, to, to experience more than just one world in, the, in, their, in their day and in, the, in their week. What is the value of that for all of us for our, and for our community? And, and if we can get a better dialogue about that um, and, and continue to, to push that question, um, then I think it pushes 
um, philanthropy to be more thoughtful about it, but also the, the bigger funders of so many youth programs is really the government. And so how do we get the government, who feels the same pressures we do, like got to serve the poorest amongst us, um, to also navigate these programs. So I think they're really difficult questions, yeah. uh, and there's not enough money to answer them. So you just got to be as smart as possible. Here, here's one way I would kind of suggest even thinking about that, though, going a little bit deeper. Um, you know, asking yourself the question, what are the, what are the, the thorny, difficult, painful issues that, that are happening in, in, in the public sector? And I'll, the one example right here, you know, the, uh, we, what is it, uh, over 45 years, this, this region, the Quad County area, uh, uh, has failed 20 separate times to pass an RTA, right? That's going to ballot in 2016. Now that affects arts and cultural programs, that affects education programs, that affects transit patterns, that affects job access, that affects a patron base that we don't even have yet, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what are the big issues in your community? You know, uh, uh, one example I was, I was talking with some, some colleagues yesterday was you know, around Los Angeles. I, met with, uh, I was there for three days, many different conversations, and no matter what, they raised a couple of issues. You know, uh, uh, involuntary displacement being one, uh, and that was tied to light rail development that was going to be expanding, as well as LA River redevelopment that was happening. So what are the big issues in the community? What are the conversations you think you can, can, can partner in on? And frankly, what are the, what are the gaps in the advocacy frame happening at that local level, that engaging the arts sector into some of the broader systems? And I would just take a page, frankly, out of uh, uh, Bruce Katz from the Book Brookings Institution. I hate being so academic about this today, but um, uh, you know, his, his whole frame, his book in the Metropolitan Revolution is like, change is not coming from the public sector uh, at the highest levels. It's not happening in, in uh, 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 for, it's not happening from Washington, it's broken. At the state levels, many state levels, it's, it's completely uh, uh, challenge as well. It's happening on the regional level. And I think, if anything, in this particular community, the area that we are currently in, I think we saw that last year, frankly, through the course of the Detroit bankruptcy, um, that help was not coming from on high. When it comes to studies, um, uh, I'm embarking on that right now on both sides. And so far, um, we found a group in New York City that's going to help us with this. And because there's so much anecdotal evidence. Right. that's out there, but it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. So we are looking, and I'm also trying to partner with other cities to do the same thing, see what the impacts are on everyone. And for me, it's not just about the musical note. It's about the citizen that we're creating, the young mm -hmm. person using music as a means. I want to create great musicians, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but I want to change society, and I think we have to change all of it. And that's, so I, I agree with the statistical analysis that you're talking about. And still hanging in the air is your question from earlier, how can practitioners teach funders? <laughs> based on what they've learned. Uh, we have uh, two and a half minutes, maybe time for one more question right here. Hey, Francisco, it's good to see you again. Um, I, listening in to, to a couple of the questions and the question over here as well, um, I think a lot of times uh, what we have failed to understand is that in poverty type neighborhoods, are seeing the arts as a lifeline. It's a process that they need to rise up. And if the arts is constantly used to serve them, it perpetuates the same thing social programming does. When you go into the black community, you serve them clothes and food. And you don't use that terminology when you're giving money to capital projects in the community you don't say we're serving the community, you say we're investing in the community. Well, if we use that terminology in these programs in the black community, we're investing in the less, it adds to the more. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times our mindsets in, in the arts is somewhat up here looking down and not starting here coming up. And that's why we're not having a lot of impact and changing the dynamics in the black community and Hispanic community because we're just serving them. And if you're just serving a community, you're perpetuating what the community is already producing. You're not adding to that community, you're just helping them. And I've seen in arts programming, when arts programming is used to raise up the community, invest in the community, you change that entire dynamic from poverty to a sense of prosperity and penury is no longer perpetuated from generation, generation to generation. I think the arts has an incredible opportunity 
to change that dynamic if they change the perspective. But as long as the arts is being communicated from here down, it's going to always see itself as the savior. And if that continues, you're going to have another generation that you're going to be saving or serving, and it's never going to change. Those kids need to get to the level where they are running arts institutions. They need to get to the level where they are the ones who are giving the money to arts programming. And they'll never get there if we keep serving them. OK, Love thanks. We are actually, we're just out of time. But any closing comments in response to that offer? So the very quick thing is I hope he didn't, uh, uh, sir, if you didn't uh, copyright anything you just said, I would like to go back over my grant materials and see if I, <laughs> the word, where the word serve uh, appears and take that out for empower yeah. or invest. I think, that's a, I think language, language is a big uh, thing that we on, on the philanthropic side need to focus on. I think also with our, our grantee partners. It, it is co-investment. It is, it is, it, and that is the frame I think that we need to move forward, frankly, in philanthropy, is, is, is thinking of ourselves as co-investors and not being this removed entity on high sprinkling dollars and hoping that something changes. So I, I appreciate everything you just said. Great. And if, and if you're going to do that, and I agree completely, we need to graduate our young people from university so they can, they can be the leaders. It's way too many young people are not graduating. 4% Latinos only graduate from four-year colleges. About 16% African-American. It changes as it goes up into different classes. We need to change those numbers and invest in our young people. They love music. They come to us. They want to sing. They trust us. That's all we're going to give them? All right, keep it going. Right after we talk, we're going to thank Francisco, George, Katie, and you. Thank you. Thank you.